Well, welcome everybody. It's lovely to have you all here today. Um, my name's Nicholas. I'm the minister here at the Aspen Chapel. I'd like to welcome all of you who are watching online. It's really good to have you joining us uh, as well. Well, we have a really special uh, morning for you today. Uh, for the last, uh, uh, yesterday, we had uh, uh, Cynthia Bourgeau here, uh, who did a whole session here from 9 uh, till 3 o'clock, and we've just had a little communion from 8.15 uh, this morning, and today we've got Cynthia uh, here, with you, uh, uh, here with you today. And those of you who don't know Cynthia, Cynthia really, uh, her, her whole ministry has come out of Aspen and related to her work with Thomas Keating. She's one of, with Thomas Keating, one of the founders of the Christian meditation method called Centering Prayer. Um, and this has really been an incredible uh, contribution that Cynthia has made to the Christian world with uh, um, Thomas Keating. And she's written a number of books about that, The Wisdom Jesus, Centering Prayer, and Inner Awakening. And, you know, she's in demand all over the world. I mean, she's off to England next week. She's, you know, Finland, Sweden, all around the place. And we were so lucky to be able to get her to, to come and be with us for a short period. We do feel we're family for her, so we did sort of press that button to say, do come and be with us. So, but we're very lucky to have her. And today's going to be a different sort of uh, event. We're going to just have a conversation with Cynthia. There'll be a little meditation, a little bit of talking, but it's an opportunity really to expose ourselves to a total Totally, you know, unique form of, of our, our Christian faith, which is fantastic. So please welcome Cynthia Bourgeau, everyone. <laughs> glory, glory. Well, hi, everybody. And it's, it's wonderful to be back. Uh, as, I, as Nicholas alluded to, I, I did spend the time here yesterday doing a six-hour kind of retreat that this, this session is kind of a continuation of. And, uh, but as I did it, and as I reflected on what I was going to put together for today, I saw more and more that, that what you said, Nicholas, is exactly true, that who I am and what I learned to be and how I got formed spiritually all happened in this valley. From, I was here from 1990 to 1970, or, or 19, 1997, working closely basically with Thomas Keating and basically living out at the monastery, uh, doing stuff mostly with Christchurch Jasmine. And then I went off to Canada for seven years to teach and came back. And Greg Anderson offered us uh, a beautiful refuge here at the chapel, and the Aspen Wisdom School was born in somewhere 2004 or 2005, depending on how you count. And so for 10 years, well, for eight years, this, the chapel was home and working down in the basement. Uh, we, we began to launch the program and the method of being of this kind of unique branding of a wisdom school, which involves uh, uh, meditation, you know, really working with spiritual practice, meditation-based, and then a wide look into the, the, the wider realms of the Christian mystical and, uh, and esoteric tradition and where it meets the other great traditions of the world. So that's the kind of stuff we went through. Any of you still remember chewing through meditations on the tarot? <laughs> uh, and then the Gospel of Thomas. We had Thomas on Tuesdays. And it took us like two and a half years to get through all the sayings of Thomas, and they became a one. So that's, that's the kind of stuff we did for 10 years. So coming back upon that has been great. Uh, I knew Nicholas and Heather when they were still in Norwich. Uh, that's where I met you. And when I heard that you were in the running for Aspen Chapel, I said, oh, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> and I put in a recommendation for my buddy. And uh, so, so I feel, in a way, a deep continuity. So what do we want to do this morning? Uh, this is the first time I've ever been the subject of an audience. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so what does an audience with Cynthia Bourgeau mean? Uh, as I structure it, as I think about it, what I want to do is offer a starting reflection, a short kind of meditation, which I'm going to draw on Thomas Keating to launch us on. And I'll offer a few words. And then after that, 
the floor will be open for conversation. Uh, and questions and responses, they can come from what we did yesterday, they can come from what, you know, the, the thing from Thomas is a pump primer to get conversation started. And we'll do that for a little while and then see how it goes. If, if people are really, really into conversation, we'll continue it. Uh, at some point, I'd like to, to call a pause in that for a little bit of time of silent meditation. And we'll see how that goes. That's my priority. Uh, but I'm not going to cut out a really lively conversation if that's where the energy is running. So we'll take it by, we'll take that part. Uh, there'll, be a, there'll be an offertory and then time for some wrap-up questions. And we basically have got an hour to play with. So uh, if that's agreeable to people, please understand that this is informal and dialogical. Nicholas will have a mic. Are you, are you running around with a lava? Yeah. So, so just to make sure that everybody hears questions that are being asked or conversations, uh, just you know, raise your hand if you want to say something, and Nicholas will come and pick you up with the, with the mic. The floor is open. It's informal. Uh, and uh, we want to raise together the spiritual questions that are on everybody's mind and heart. So, as the pump primer, I want to share with you one of my favorite, all-time favorite, short reflections from Thomas Keating called The Beauty of Chaos. Uh, and this is buried in one of his late books called Reflections on the Unknowable which was published in, uh, in 2014, or you know, about, about four years before his death. So we're witnessing here vintage late Thomas Keating. And during the last five years of his life, uh, he went through this sort of powerful synthesis where he, he emerged beyond all question as a realized spiritual master. Uh, and I'm, I'm not trying to put on any sort of valley hype here. It was his buddies, like the Dalai Lama and others, who recognized him as that, a fully evolved, non-dual presence in the Christian tradition. And during that time also, Thomas, who was at that point approaching 90 years old, pulled out all the stops and stopped sort of watering down what he was saying and being quite so worried about how it was being received. Let it go. See what people do with it. So this is one of these essays, and I love it. Thomas, toward the end, was reading extensively in neuroscience and quantum physics. He wanted to understand how the world was actually working and how traditional modes of contemplation intersected with that. So this was a great mind. He, he once told me, I have all the diseases known to man except Alzheimer's. <laughs> <laughs> that much was totally true. He, he remembered more than most of us would have ever forgotten, or he'd forgotten more than most of us ever remembered, however you put it. But I want to read you just a couple of paragraphs from this to start the conversation. The beauty of chaos. So, we try so hard to put order into our lives and into the cosmos. There is none. Instead, there are lots of comings and goings, ups and downs. In fact, everything at the subatomic level is chaos. Moments of perfect order coalesced only to dissolve again into the thrilling immensity of infinite possibilities. Love is all because it is nowhere, not one place, but every place. Every form is teeming with life and with various forms of consciousness or no consciousness, like bees swarming in, or in a hive or ants on an anthill Life on everyday level is busy, yet it's doing nothing. 
remaining for a moment and then quickly passing away, only to be back in another form, in another kind of community, in another chaos. Chaos is our home. It is always becoming, ending, and starting anew. And he concludes from this a couple of paragraphs later. Nothing really matters because everything matters and is happening all at the same time. Nothing is remembered or forgotten. It is all here at once. Everything is in the moment, going nowhere, but enjoying everywhere and everything. This is creation, endless, delightful, unpredictable, unbelievable. Uh, just isness and is-ing, playing with goodness, beauty, and truth, without purpose, without plan, without judgment, in perfect peace in the midst of activity and no activity. Well, when you consider that from the perspective of traditional theology, we've come a long ways, baby. <laughs> you know, and this this breaks so heavily with the classic setup of the past, of the last like 2,500 years of human and religious culture, in which we've tended to identify God with eternal changelessness. And of course, we'll lament the changes and the twists and the turns of this life, but we look to a future world which is characterized by order and stability. Uh, and so much of spirituality is based on that. And when we do contemplative practice, and even when back when Thomas started to do introduce centering prayer, it was all with the sort of sense that this gives us a foretaste of the eternal changelessness which is hard, ours by birthright. And the world was looked at as this sort of temporary swirl, but you know, hey, we get through it. Thomas says, uh-uh, at the end. He says, you know, if you really look around, the only thing that is permanent, the only thing that we know is change. Constant, eternal fluctuation. Going across all levels, from the subatomic to the macrocosmic, all in change, all in motion, not moving itself to a final endpoint. You know, to, even Teilhard was a verging a, a an omega point where everything converges. I says no, eternal fluctuation, eternal pay, play, creating, uncreating, going nowhere, and yet full of the whole thing. And betcha, 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 if you look at your meditation carefully, you find it's like that for you. You know, sit down to do meditation for 25 minutes, you get probably 24 minutes and a half of constant fluctuation and chaos, right? The mind is restless, up and down, we're, we're deeply in silence, and then boom, you know, what am I doing thinking about my lunch menu? Or, uh, you know, and so this is a celebration. But I think it's a celebration that comes with a profound kind of feeling like being dropped down an elevator shaft. Because uh, how do we prepare to live in a world whose actual observable empirical nature is this constant fluctuation, and not necessarily even in a direction. I mean, Jacob Burma, the medieval mystic, once said, well, good wipes out what, what evil creates, evil wipes out what good creates. It's all a useless carving in the great industriousness of bad, you know. And this vision that we keep rewriting to ourselves toward, that God is right, we are on the side of right, right will triumph, and right always winds up looking a lot like what we think right should be. 
And so we tend in our own age to get devastated. You know, what is all this about? What is all the atomization, the splintering, the polarization? The, it looks like the collapse of our country, the collapse of democratic ideals. Uh, truth, you know, what is truth according to who? Siloing, splintering, AI. How do we live in this kind of a world? And one option is to try and get our bearings in eternal changelessness. This is what contemplation has always done. But the other, which Thomas is inviting us to in these last decades of nine, nine decades of life, nine and a half decades of life, is to forget all that. Forget these maps that are constantly trying to rewrite ourselves toward an imposed order, and instead learn to find our sea legs in a sea that's constantly sloshing around us. And our contemplative practice in this case, and our spirituality, has a different, different means. It has a different kind of center in it now, because it's not to pull us out of the fray or to help us take refuge in something that's permanent, but to teach us how to so quickly replenish ourselves from the abundance of everything that's present in the midst of and through the chaos. How do we live with that? So I spoke yesterday very, very briefly about the idea that comes basically from integral evolutionary consciousness no matter what vision of it you like, that we are really at the end of an era that has really dominated the way human beings have seen the world for about 2,500 years, 3,000 years. And, uh, and in that time, the, the first axial period, as it's called, all of our great religious traditions took their present form. Some of them were founded, like Christianity. Some of them came to their forms. Our great philosophical traditions were born. Our great cultural systems were born. Uh, it's been our frame of reference for as long as we know. And so if it seems like everything is up to grabs today, and like, wow, 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 it's true because we're hitting a double whammy of the end of an era, the rightful progression into a new, whole new structure of consciousness. Chaotic as hell, and the breakdown of the old structure of consciousness feels like a loss of everything, and we lose our hope. And we say, well, what's the good of standing up for anything? What's the good of truth? What's if, what, what do you do? Why not just go hide? But the good news is that something is being born in the midst of it. And it's being born not in opposition to the conditions, but through the conditions. And I'd suggest as a kickoff to our discussion today that this, this sort of augurs for us the possibility of not only a new kind of spirituality, but a new kind of contemplation, which is not about anymore rewriting ourselves back to an eternal truth, but finding that eternal truth in the midst of the change and flux fluctuation. Uh, and not separating ourselves out from the world to try and calm so much as finding that calm in the midst of it, like a Sufi turner or a whirling dervish who can stay absolutely still in the process of everything flying apart at 100 miles a second. Uh, I believe that in our new era, we're going to be called on as the new human beings working in this new consciousness uh, to demonstrate and to work out of three qualities of being. First of all, a deep grounding in a basic inner pulse. 
that we hear not only through the chaos, but as the midst of it. And one of the most powerful spiritual lessons I ever learned was from a teacher who just taught us to do this. She started out, and you can do this along with me if you want. Just do something and tap, bum, 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 bum. Then take your, one of your arms, bum, 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 bum. Get the message? Things can speed up, but there's always that basic pulse. So they're not just getting frenetic. They're accelerating in tempo in relationship to a basic pulse. And if you can tune to that basic pulse and hear it running through everything, you're able to accelerate tempo without getting fraying at the seams, falling into multitasking. I had a friend once who, who was a great sailboat artist, and he took us through storms of the sea uh, when the ocean's going like this. I said, how in the world do you do it? He says, I always listen to and tune to the deeper pulse of the sea. So that's the basic, that's the first skill, to hear that basic pulse and hear acceleration and chaos in relationship to it. Second skill is what, what Peter Kingsley, our wonderful crazy Peter Kingsley, once called metis, the Greek word for skill, particularly in timing. To know when to stand back and how to move strategically to interact with that wonderful chaos. Sometimes we withdraw, sometimes you act, and when you act, you act with the right force and the right timing. It's a skill that can only be learned in the present. Drawing not from external templates of what you think, but from the information that's there right in the now. And the final is what I would call impartiality. And I, 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 I fumbled around fine for a while to find the word that I think worked best. It's non-judgment, it's equanimity, but it's something more than that because it's also the capacity to stand in the face of great tragedy, great loss, great chaos, great grief without being taken apart. It's almost sphinx-like in its capacity. And one of the things that we do face in this world today is watching the death of things that we've held dear. And not getting swept up in grief, which is just another sort of way of slowing down the whole process. That this, and this is where this beautiful teaching of Thomas can help. Infinite play, things go, things come. Things reach there under the lifetime. Don't get identified. The forms will be back. So these are really, really different skills from what have ever been called forth from us before. But I think Thomas was pointing us towards that if we want to be spiritual practitioners and contemplatives in a world which is hanging on this cusp and try to do our part in handing it on in the best way we can to future generations which are going to have to unravel this mess. Uh, th these are the skills that we need to celebrate and teach in our spiritual gathering places. So with that, I'm going to shut up and I'm going to offer any of you a space to comment 
question, uh, converse, floors open. I'm Laura Whitley. Thank you for being here. I'm interested in the last of the three skills you talked about developing, mm -hmm. and it, f with all due respect, it's a tall ask to um, to deal with the loss of the things we hold dear. So, h how can you break that down? How you get to that type of equanimity or grace you're um, referring to? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that question. That really hits the heart of it. Uh, and there's a trick there, because the, we're not talking about repression, you know, or disidentification so that you don't touch the feeling, but we're talking about being able to live in the process of great grief with a way that it doesn't unravel us completely and, and, and render us incapable of absorbing it. Because we're going to be asked to absorb tragedies and grief that we can't even imagine nowadays. And the, the weak and the fragile hearts are going to buckle under this weight. Uh, and it's going to be part of the, the pathos of our error. For me, it all finally comes back to the, the foundational starting point of centering prayer. And the foundational centering prayer point is that in this practice of meditation, uh, the, the, the teaching is that you're sitting there wishing to be totally present to the presence of the divine, to this chaos, if you want to call it. And what will happen is that thoughts intrude. And that in centering prayer, a thought is defined as anything that brings your attention to a focal point. It could be a thought, but it could be a feeling, a memory, an emotion. Uh, but if your attention goes like that and starts thinking about it, that's a thought. And we're taught in Centering Prayer to let the thoughts go just by practicing releasing. It, it's, you let it go. I actually teach people this practice as a gesture first. And that gesture is actually taught in, it's replicated inside, not by big physical hands, but as you let it go. And the whole point in centering prayer is not to keep a steady mind, actually, but to practice this letting go. So modern neuro, neuroscience has confirmed that this action of letting go actually is the neurological shift from small mind into spacious mind. And we practice it again and again and again. So you learn in small things, you know, when you, you find yourself sitting there in the chaos thinking about, you know, I wonder what I'm gonna order for lunch today. You just let it go. But little by little, this pattern of being able to do this somehow miraculously strengthens a capacity in you to stand in the face of deep sorrow without clinging, but without being destroyed, because it's the hanging on to it that actually makes it intolerable and that shatters your soul. You can experience it deeply as feeling and then let it go, and somehow something kicks in from this new creation that Thomas is talking about that replenishes it, not with goodness and happiness, but with this sort of <coughs> I'm still here and I stand. And to feel that capacity growing up in you, I shall not be undone. Not out of some sort of strong, forceful will, but just because you've managed to, to in some sense, place your attention and your being deeper in the cosmos. Uh, that's about all I can say, except that you've just asked the core question to how we find that skill that allows us to be present without shutting down our hearts, without becoming bitter or cynical or hopeless or desperate, or in the final analysis, shattering into mental illness ourselves. 
And, and this concerns me a lot deeply because people who have been growing up in really sort of emotionally entitled lives for the past couple of decades, as we've tried to make our children feel like it's safe to be here <laughs> when it manifestly isn't, you know, we've got to toughen up if we are going to stand present to what is to come, I believe, before we hit the bottom of this. But we have to toughen up in a new way by trusting the chaos and the ultimate order running through it rather than, uh, rather than trying to make the world safe enough so that we can even survive emotionally. So that's just the tip of the iceberg of a whole, you know, it's two years, five years, or a lifetime of training. But, but I wanted to honor today publicly that I think that's where the training leads us in real mature spiritual practice. Greetings, my name's uh, Brennan, and I I'm actually just got one of your books from the, uh, the chapel a couple of weeks ago on Centering Prayer. And um, one of the things I entered into spirituality actually through the Eastern tradition um, was gr grew up in a, an agnostic household. Mm -hmm. and, and so one of the things I really always appreciated about the Eastern tradition was the sort of the just uh, being very skeptical of anything ego oriented or yeah. sort of for me, I kind of get to a place where it's like anytime I anything that's verbal, I just don't trust. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very distrusting of, yeah. of my inner dialogue. Um, but then. Um, Heather uh, had read this poem and, and turned me on to John, John O'Donohue, if you're yep. familiar with him. And yep. one of the things he talks about, one of his criticisms of the Eastern tradition I thought was really interesting was this idea of you sort of relinquish this individuality yep. into becoming like just sort of this non-dual blob. Mm -hmm. And we all know that's not true. I'm sure with uh, Thomas Keating and others, they've reached this state, they still have this personality that's there that's expressing itself yeah um, and so this is a long way to ask about um, I've noticed in my family members like my grandfather was a born-again Christian yeah who had that sort of experience of that just the spaciousness and the yeah. emptiness and but then he his ego just took it over and then he was yeah. like went to the I know everything that's right and you're yeah. wrong and then I'm gonna make the world the way that I want it because yeah. I know because I touched God and, mm -hmm. and then my brother kind of went down the same path actually through centering prayer with Thomas Keating, and so um, I'm wondering, what is it that you use or would suggest to stay grounded for that trick that happens uh, when you get to that place and you have that experience to be able to stay grounded in the being and get into John O'Donohue called it the rhythm, yeah. you know, where you're just trusting and things sort of emerge mm -hmm. uh, and not get sucked into that. Oh, I know what the answer is. I know what the key is yeah, to the yeah. castle. You know, that's such a great question. And, and it's a question that could really be properly answered with a short book because it, it names and exposes so many of the demons in Christianity uh, around self, soul, devotion. And uh, I can't try to do justice to all of those of these, but I, I would say, first of all, that you're quite right that we have within ourselves two places, two experiences of selfhood, and we don't understand the relationship between them. One is of this infinite, unboundary thing that can, uh, can float and roll and just knows the vastness. And the other is this little smaller self that's very, very busy establishing order and security and identity and personhood. And classic spiritual training has always labeled that first one as somehow an energy, an enemy, or a, you know, that you gotta get rid of it, you gotta dismantle it, and then you just live in unboundaried stuff, but it's not true. And the Christians know God love them for all their excesses that it's not true. The Jews get it too, the Muslims get it, the Western traditions tend to get it that there is a purpose for this little finite self. And the, the only real problem is to find out what the relationship between the two is. And at that point, you can come back to the wonderful teachings that you probably threw out as a kid if you ever heard them growing up in an agnostic family about what does incarnation mean? 
you know, and you start with, so God became man and Jesus Christ. Well, whatever you make of that as a theology, what you can make of it as an actual practice is that something that was infinite and unboundaried decided to come into form in order to express something that can only be expressed in form and needs a small self to do it. You know, you didn't just get Christ, you got Jesus. And so he walks around and he gets in trouble and people hate him and people string him up on a cross and uh, what's the relationship between these two? And the other thing is that in this small Jesus, he could look at himself and he could call God Abba, Father. And he can, from that small self, offer up devotion like a parent, like a child to a parent, and in that express a current of love. So my sense is that somehow the, the ultimate answer to this conundrum you raise lies in the fact that we are all here from unboundaried consciousness in constriction in order to express something holy about the nature of God that requires this. And so we're all given a small self, like a violin that we play to play in the symphony orchestra. But the trick is to learn that you're not your violin. It's absolutely essential to making the music. It has to be kept in tune and you have to play it capably and even masterfully. But so that we move back and forth ourselves between boundary and unboundary devotion helps us. And what gets lost on either end is when you get stuck. When you get stuck in either the infinite or in the finite. And the problem with your buddies is they got stuck in the finite. And it's always easier to, to immediately jump in and let the small self claim that infinite and colonize it and say, my soul and my rightness. It's a mistake. It's a metaphysical mistake. And Christianity hasn't had teaching yet that names and nails it. So people go on making it. And then people get irritated by that and throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, so much for Christianity, I'm going to go be a Buddhist. And, and that's fine. That represents a different color and a true color. But there is something that is known in the Western traditions about the dynamic reciprocal relationship between finitude and infinitude. And if we could only name that, honor it, and learn how to work with it, we'd see a better Christianity, and we'd be, see a better family of all the religions. So work to be done by future generations. But thank you for naming that. Bruce. Right. Hi. Good we morning. meet again. Thank you. <laughs> it's been great. Um, I was wondering, you know, in the sort of the, the last 10 years, there's been this huge explosion in McMindfulness, you know, apps, et cetera. And I was wondering, as you observe that, what, what are the pros and cons of that? And then has anyone figured out how to help people go from sort of McMindfulness to, you know, some more robust loving kindness because uh, you know it's it's it, it's a it's an awareness at least you know yeah. and, and I just yeah. was curious if you you were on top of that trend well this is an interesting conversation that's developing I mean it spins off it right off your question Brennan Brennan or Brennan Brennan yeah it spins off Brennan's that what basically people are trying to do is to use mindfulness techniques to perfect the small self, the violin, you know, to make me more calm, more peaceful, more mindful. They keep taking it back to the small self without realizing that in the original teachings from which this comes, they are gateways into being able to live more stably in your more expansive self and to expand out to it. So they're not really for the, for the building up of the, the little self but to begin to transfer you so that you understand that there is this other and to be able to flow back and forth more gracefully for them. We haven't gotten to that place yet. 
because people don't really know about this other self until it starts to grow. And that brings us back to your question at the beginning. The small self can't stand up to what we're going to face here. But the, small, the larger self is not the unboundaried self. Okay? This is where Cynthia gets controversial. We all think that it's the unboundaried self. What it is is the dynamic reciprocal flow between the boundaried and the unboundaried that allows us to play ourselves like an accordion. But we more and more keep our home in that which is larger and experience pouring from the larger into the smaller to, to, to replenish it, to do the work it has to do, and offering from the smaller into the larger. So the real self lies in the flow between the two. And so I think that somehow or another, you know, a lot of Buddhists are worrying about this and sort of saying, well, did we really screw it up by giving people all those new toys they can put on their app to protect, protect, them, protect themselves? But I think what's really needed is teaching that takes people to the next step and gathering places such as this where they can collectively articulate it and celebrate it. Because there is a next step that we're trying to get to. So I'd say, yes, yeah, start with them. I watch, they help, my, they help my daughter and son-in-law a lot to just get out of, you know, otherwise being pulverized in the onrush of the now with no divine in the chaos, just chaos. But we have to take it to a new place. Yeah, we'll take this as the last question in, um, before we, the last question for now. Um, I tend to think of things more scientifically, and that's a fault. But in my uh, journey with spirituality, um, I've started using meditation. And I read a book called Altered Traits. Mm -hmm. And I do feel like, some of my traits have improved. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. That makes 100% sense to me because as I, as I was teaching a little bit at the Eucharist this morning, you know, that, that as long as we live completely in that smaller self, only in that smaller self, we're going to live according to what Thomas Keating called the false self system which is what's going to dominate in us. Our, he called them our emotional programs for happiness. They're basically, Maslow would call us our basic security instincts for security, survival, for esteem and affection, for power and control. And whatever we want, our programming when we're living exclusively in that small self is going to be dominated by those things. You know, that's what happened once again to your people who stole it. It was the small self with its false self systems for power and control grabbed it. So what, what the meditation practices do is they begin to loosen you up and give you a taste of something in you which is not just that. And when that happens, it immediately begins to soften those usually unconscious hard edges that we bring into everything else when we're living just in our small self. So it begins to set us in motion of your traits, by which we often mean those false self agendas and programs. Uh, they soften. And you may discover that your real traits are very different from what you thought they were when you were living in the small self. So that is indeed a, a, a shifting, and it just keeps on going. And that as, as people become more and more stable and comfortable in that unknown and not having a self with boundaries in it and being one with the, with the flow and the process itself, then these things that used to be the hard edges of personality soften and you get a room of people that are not high maintenance. <laughs> and then you can start making spiritual music. It's like a, finally you get an orchestra that can play in tune. So, so 
I think at this point, looking a little bit about the general flow of the day, what we're going to do now is to take a, uh, a short, uh, well, let's, let's tend to first to one of the sacred rituals of the chapel necessary for the survival, which is the offering back of, uh, of that which is uh, the good we have received, otherwise known as the offertory. And how about if we, Nicholas, where's Nicholas? I'm here, yes. Do you want to explain to us further how that's done? And then we will resume and, uh, and, and finish up a few more things. Okay, good. So um, we have a, a, an offertory here. So if you'd like to, if you're in the room, Heather's going to be playing a little bit on the uh, uh, recorder. And if you'd like to just walk up while she's playing, and, and if you'd like to make a contribution, please feel free to do that. Uh, those of you online, uh, there's a donate button there, and uh, please uh, feel free to use that donate button. And if you're watching this on Facebook, you can go to the Aspen Chapel uh, or on, on YouTube. You can go to the Aspen Chapel website and make a donation uh, through the website, aspenchapel.org. Yeah, sure. I just want to say... Um, one of the reasons that I love playing the recorder is that it's an expression for me of everything that we've just been talking about. It's like the expansion, the constriction. I mean, so just while you do whatever you're doing, listen out for that in yourself too. Like when in my mistakes, like my mistakes belong and the expansive moments belong. It's just all such an expression. It's not a lovely thing I'm going to play, but it, whatever I play, it counts. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Heather. Oh. Yep. So, as we come down to the close, I mean, one of the things that was beautiful to me is to watch the community engage. And yesterday in our conversation, I tried to describe centering prayer a little bit for people who hadn't learned how to do it at this point, and I, we talked about the sacred word which is used in centering prayer to help release thoughts when we realize we're, we're thinking in return to the word, and I likened it to a blade, a windshield wiper, that actually I hadn't done this, it was my daughter that first suggested this. She says, oh, I see, it's just like it wipes the screen clean when it's raining, and the rain still keeps falling, doesn't it? And I said, yeah, it's not, it's not there to stop the rain, the rain being the thoughts, just to wipe the screen clear. So we, we tried some centering prayer, and when I, when I left at the end of yesterday's teaching, I found this little poem on my... Uh, on my podium here uh, by Justin Nyberg, wherever you are, if you're out there today. But I, I found this wonderful and a marvelous way uh, to introduce us to about just five minutes of silence to sit together uh, and pool our energies as a group. So, 
an original composition. Thank you, Justin, called Meditation on a Rainy Windshield. The rain falls. The wiper cleans it. More rain falls. The wiper cleans it. The rain continues. 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 The wiper cleans it. The sun comes out. The rain and wipers stop. The light pours in and in and in. Let's just sit, whether in the rain or in the sun, in the beauty of chaos, for about five minutes. And 
So I'd, I'd like to conclude this session by reading one more time those words from Thomas Keating, The Beauty of Chaos. We try so hard to put order into our lives and into the cosmos. There is none. Instead, there are lots of comings and goings, ups and downs. In fact, everything at the subatomic level is chaos. Moments of perfect order coalesce only to dissolve again into the thrilling immensity of infinite possibilities. Love is all because it is nowhere, not one place, but every place. Every form is teeming with life and with various forms of consciousness or no consciousness. Like bees swarming or in a hive or ants on an anthill, life on every level is busy, yet it's doing nothing, remaining for a moment and then quickly passing away only to be back in another form, in another kind of community, in another chaos. Chaos is our home. It is always becoming, ending, and starting anew. And so, may we all go forth courageously into the chaos, uh, learning to develop our resilience within it, not to lament that it ain't the good old days anymore. So, Nicholas, over to you. Uh, well, I'd like to just to say thank you so much to Cynthia um, for giving your time, for schlepping across the world and in planes and, and all that sort of business to get here and then to go back again, which we really appreciate you, you doing, and it's a, a real effort. But I think it's so valuable because you bring here the one thing that is in most short supply in the whole world, and that's wisdom. <laughs> and I'd like to thank you for the wisdom that you bring us and that you encourage us in, in developing our own wisdom. Ladies and gentlemen, Cynthia Brajot. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to invite you uh, to come downstairs and join us for some uh, tea and coffee and yummies which are available. Also, just be aware of the art show that's going on at the moment. It's a biannual uh, show which is curated. Um, fantastic works of art. You can buy them, so please feel free to do that. And if you want a little bit more wisdom, then on Tuesday nights at 5.30 here, uh, Mimi does a yoga and meditation class, and it's really worth coming along to that if you'd like that. And hopefully see all of you here uh, next Sunday at 9.30. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, and I gather by instructions that I'm going to sit up here for a little bit longer while everybody graduates, graduates downstairs. So anybody who wants to come and pick my brains before we all move into the pile, you know, come on around there, but then I'll be making my way downstairs. So uh, I will see you all. Don't run off. Uh, thank you all. It's been a wonderful time together. Thank you for your questions. See you next time. <laughs>